Shalom and welcome to today's Middle East Report. On this programme today, we'll be discussing the incredible role played by Australia in helping to re-establish the Jewish state of Israel by liberating Beersheba and the Holy Land from the Ottoman Turks over 100 years ago. Warm welcome to the programme. And my guest today is all the way from Australia. His name is uh, Pastor Greg Cunning. Uh, Pastor Greg, uh, welcome to the Middle East Report. And it's an absolute pleasure to have another Australian on, uh, on the programme. Thank you, Simon. It's great to be here. Excellent. And, and Greg, um, before we start about um, your, your trip to Israel, in which you were at the famous city of Beersheba, uh, you were part of a 10,000 Australian contingent um, that actually celebrated the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Beersheba, which we'll talk about later, and the incredible role played by the Australian and New Zealand forces in helping to liberate the Holy Land from the Ottoman Turks. Can you share with us how you came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? and how he gave you this uh, love and passion for the land of Israel and also the people of Israel. Yes, sure. Look, uh, in my university years back in 1985, uh, someone was bold enough to share uh, about Jesus to me. And uh, I, I sort of had a, had a love of God, but, you know, but not really understanding the gospel. And so that's how I uh, first met Jesus, it was in those days I ended up in a church and start, made a commitment to serve the Lord and have done so uh, my entire life with my wife, Jay. Uh, we've been in ministry together for 32 years. I'm a minister of the gospel, my wife uh, with me. Um, we've been married 30 of those 32 years. So it's been a wonderful journey uh, of faith with the Lord. Um, and just recently, probably in the last five years or so, uh, in my role as a pastor, particularly and in business and missions, has the Lord really uh, challenged me to focus on the nation of Israel. And uh, for me, it's just, it's been like a, a whole new revelation. It's opened up a whole different, a uh, lot of doors to me and my faith and made uh, my faith in God and my faith in Jesus so much richer to have discovered the role that Israel plays inside the kingdom of God. And the, the requirement for us to really have a passion for the nation of Israel is, has been something that has f become foremost for me. Uh, along with my passion to see people come to the Lord Jesus, this has become a, a, a very important part of that. Absolutely. And in terms of um, spiritually understanding the significance of Israel and the Jewish people, when the Lord opened your eyes to the significance of Israel, according to his word and according to the plans and purposes that he has for the nation of Israel and the Jewish people, how did that change your perception of God? Um, look, I, th I think as a pastor in a, uh, one of the big, biggest Pentecostal church movements in Australia, um, we... Uh, we have a tendency to be very focused on winning people to the Lord. My question, the Lord challenged me, was what are we winning people to? What's next? And the kingdom of God has become a, a major part of my life. Uh, God, Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom of God. And so the, the, the role that the nation of Israel plays is fundamental to the kingdom of God. The the scriptures can be looked through a filter where Israel is not a focus and the Jewish people are not a focus, or they can be viewed through the filter of Israel, the people that Jesus was speaking to at the time, Jesus himself being a Jewish man, Paul being a Jewish man, Peter and the disciples being Jewish people, and understanding the kingdom of God through the filter of the time and the, the, the nation that it's being spoken through is, I think, critical. It brings us critical understanding of the kingdom of God. That's why I said before, it's given me a new, rich depth to my understanding of the kingdom of God. And of course, uh, Simon, when Jesus comes back, he's coming back to the nation of Israel. 
if you believe that he's coming back, as, as I do, and your know, eschatology aligns with the, the scriptures in Jeremiah and Isaiah, Ezekiel and Zechariah and the Old Testament, and of course, all through the New Testament. And where is he ruling and reigning from? Jerusalem, which is at the time the capital of the nation of Israel. And uh, the famous scriptures from Isaiah chapter 2 and um, um, Micah chapter 4, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Israel. It's tomorrow's newspaper and he is still referred to as the God of Israel. Critical, I think. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more with you, Greg. And uh, we're here today to talk about the incredible battle that took place over 100 years ago, uh, known as the Battle of Beersheba. This was the first victory that the Anzac forces had, known as the Australian New Zealand Army Corps, uh, during the First World War. Um, prior to, I think it was in 1915, unfortunately, the Australian forces had a, um, a crippling defeat, the Battle of Gallipoli, in which they were uh, reposted to Egypt to Fight against the Egypt, uh, to fight against the Ottoman Turks from Egypt, and sadly there was a heavy battle that was lost in Gaza, um, and then it was a decision made by General Allenby of the British forces and commanding also the Anzac forces to take the battle and the city of Beersheba. How important is this in terms of an historical event for Australia? Well, it, it's massively important, and it's something that we. Uh, you know, as Australians, very proud as Australians in our role in, in various wars. Um, of course, as you mentioned, Gallipoli is probably, you know, the Australian holy day in a way. Um, many, many thousands and thousands of Australians go and visit Gallipoli. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's very deep in our psyche. Uh, we were mates, we Anzacs, Australian, New Zealanders, part with the British to try and break through there in the Dardanelles. Uh, we failed. It was a, it was a fail, failed military uh, battle, and, but it led to the Battle of Beersheba. We, it was, both battles were against the Ottoman Turkish um, Empire, essentially, and under the leadership of uh, General Allenby and um, you know, uh, Harry Chevelle, who was the, the leader of the Light Horse and, and ran that campaign all the way up to Aleppo and Syria, the Australians uh, were in a significant, I would say, a significant kingdom battle. And I think that in Australia, whilst it's not probably recognised as greatly as the Gallipoli battle, uh, it is gaining momentum, especially around the 100th celebration. Uh, we've just had that um, at Beersheba. It's gaining momentum and understanding and the significance of it is that our small nation, I mean big in size but small in population, was involved in the one of the critical junctures on the removal of the Ottoman Empire which was holding that holy land, you know the, the future as we know now, uh, the, the home of the Jewish people, was holding it from prophetic fulfilment. So yes, it's a massive, significant role that our little nation played in that. And, and I think as Australians start to understand that, they realise this is, this is an amazing event. Absolutely. So let's uh, remind ourselves of what happened over 100 years ago as the Anzac forces, particularly the Australian Light Horse, uh, defeated the Ottoman Turks at the Battle of Beersheba, which was a crucial victory leading to the liberation of Jerusalem in December 1917. Two years after the disaster of Gallipoli in 1915, the British Imperial forces had gained momentum against the Turks and their advance now rested on breaking the Ottoman Empire's grip on a 42 kilometre stretch of road, trenches and barbed wire running from Beersheba in what is now known as Israel to the fortress of Gaza on the coast. Now, hitting Gaza directly twice before had failed, killing 10,000 Allied soldiers. So, by October, an elaborate plan had been hatched to take the Beersheba end instead, involving more than 60,000 troops, 15,000 Desert Mounted Corps and the Anzac Mounted Units. From dawn till late afternoon, horse mounted units had edged in, but none had got much closer than about two kilometres from the city limits. Time was running out and 800 men and horses forming Australia's 12th and 4th Light Horse Regiments drawn mainly from New South Wales and Victoria were about to make up for it. 
Galloping at high speed into volleys of enemy fire, the Australians leapt clear over the last line of Turkish defences. Trenches nearly one and a half metres wide and right over the heads of stunned Turkish soldiers three metres below. We could see the horses jumping the trenches, dust everywhere. The Australians had stormed through with only handheld bayonets to defend themselves. The rifles slung over their backs were considered useless for firing when riding at such speed. Once over, the troopers still had to climb out of the saddle and engage in ground fighting with the Turks. Almost 40 were killed before the rest surrendered. By 11 o'clock that night, Beersheba, with its water wells, rail lines and weaponry, was under British control. Hundreds of Turkish soldiers had been killed, 1,100 taken prisoner, against the loss of 31 Australian lives. For a nation stung by heavy casualties in Gallipoli and on the Western Front, the stunning charge of the light horsemen at Beersheba quickly became the stuff of military legend. Their plucky traits of boldness, courage and ingenuity fed that emerging Australian character that the young nation was latching onto and which still endures today. Absolutely uh, incredible courage and bravery shown by the Australian light horse. Uh, I'm very impressed by that news report there, uh, Greg. Um, and considering that um, the Australian forces lost so many lives in the Battle of Gallipoli in, um, in 1915, uh, and now here, the battle for Beersheba, in which uh, the British forces, together with the Anzac forces, only had one day to capture that city. Otherwise, um, there would have been no water and uh, our British forces would have been almost dying for lack of water. Uh, and of course, the Australian forces as well. Um, do you see the hand of God and providence in that battle? Considering only 31 soldiers lost their lives. Unquestionably. This was something that... Um, uh, I mean, the significance of the hand of God cannot be lost on this battle. Uh, at the very same time a decision was being made in Parliament in, in, in England uh, and the Balfour de Declaration was being agreed upon on the same day at very nearly the same hour, um, which would have had no meaning without this breakthrough of the Ottoman Empire. So absolutely the hand of God is evident on this. I don't necessarily think that most of the Australians considered that at the time. Well, this is the hand of God. You know, we're involved in some bigger plan for the kingdom of God and the re-establishment of the Jewish nation. I don't think it was that way at all. Looking in hindsight, um, I don't think you can deny, um, I think many people probably would like to try, but you can't deny this critical timing of this battle. Also, I think we have to uh, discuss something about the uh, uh, Australian psyche mm. uh, to actually um, go on that uh, lightning charge, which was considered, uh, we saw in that news report, uh, went down in military legends, um, and also the last cavalry charge in military history as well. Um, what was it about the Australian soldier, and particularly those riding those horses, that showed so much bravery, so much courage to actually take the city? What is it in the Australian psyche that drove those soldiers to do what they did? Well, there's a couple of things there that uh, to understand Australian psyche just a little bit. Um, look, they have a they have a uh, Australians, and I say they, we have a, a, a tendency to not really pay too much respect to the orders, and and so there's a uh, we're probably a rougher nation, uh, you know, the highest uh, percentage um, four-wheel drives per capita in the world. We love the great outdoors. We like it a little bit rough, I suppose. But our boys uh, there on that day weren't actually cavalry. You mentioned a cavalry charge. They were mounted infantrymen. Uh, the normal form of combat was to take the horses to the battle. They'd dismount off their horses, one of each four would hold the other horses and the other three would go and fight. On this occasion, I don't know, uh, it was a pre-planned, uh, there's a lot of debate about whether this was just a flash decision by Harry, Harry uh, Chevelle and, and ordering General Grant in there, but there's enough proof to say that this was actually pre-planned. It definitely was water-based. And I think uh, when he said charge, our guys just went at it. The horses were used to grouping together. Uh, they were used to 
uh, walking together, etc., and they just charge it. The, the other part of the, the Australian psyche is the, the whole underdog thing and, 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 and mateship. There's two parts at play here, and I think it's important to bring that out. The, uh, the Australians like to support the underdog. Like, as a pastor of a church, we'd often find that people rallied around single mums with kids or kids, poor kids or whatever. Uh, we're not really big about the big tall poppy syndrome. Uh, those that have made it, you know, out in, in, in America, you've got the Abraham Lincoln um, oh, yeah. monument. We have the dog on the tucker box, you know. That's, <laughs> that's a bit of a typical underdog Australian psyche, but also the one of mateship. And I think that's important to bring out here, Simon, is because a uh, hundred years later, we're looking at our Prime Minister, the Prime Minister of Israel, the Governor General of New Zealand, coming together with many thousands of Australians and there's a sense of mateship. When I was standing just as the, the, the troops were walking along the road, I was with Jewish people on either side. I found myself not around too many Australians. We were using Google Translate to communicate with each other in English and Hebrew, and they were just as much excited about this event as we were and understood the history there in Beersheba. And there's a sense of mateship, I think, uh, uh, with Australia and Israel that has never gone away since this battle. Incredible. And also, um, I, I think uh, this battle represent the first victory for the Anzac forces. Um, it was a moment um, where the nation of Australia and also the nation of New Zealand, who were, you know, are still part of the British Commonwealth uh, and then would have considered part of the British Empire at the time, really came into their own in terms of nationhood. What, what does it mean for uh, if you can imagine 100 years ago, um, Australians being called up to fight in the First World War and to fight for the British Empire, to fight against the German and the Ottoman Empire and to find themselves in the Holy Land and playing their part in liberating the Holy Land from the Ottoman Turks to actually play their part in fulfilment of in God's prophetic time clock to re-establish the Jewish state of Israel in his ancient covenant homeland. Uh, look. To be honest, I don't think a whole lot of that was going through the minds of the men at that time. That's just my, yeah, my, yeah, yeah. my thoughts are they were there to fight. They've come from Gallipoli. You know, we've moved around Egypt and up into Israel. I think uh, that, uh, that um, this, I mean, it, Turkey, Israel is a long way from Australia. So Australia really is playing a part in a war that's a long way from, from home. Um, and I think we're just in there with our mates to make sure that our mates win. In this case, the Empire, as the British Empire, uh, not forgetting the Scots were involved in this, this battle and the and New Zealanders. So I think probably didn't give it too much thought of the wider, bigger picture of the Kingdom of God and the significance of an Israel that was to be re-established. I don't think that was high on their thoughts at the time. As I said, hindsight gives us this incredible view of the brilliance of the timing of God. Um, and it would be unfair to say that this was an all Australian New Zealand battle. As we know, there was great loss from the British and the Scots in their diversionary role in that area of Gaza and coming up from the rear in Beersheba as well. But it was the Australian light horse and the New Zealanders who made that final charge. So yes, it's gone down in history and look, we're incredibly proud. Fantastic. So let's uh, remind ourselves of uh, that battle of Beersheba that took place over 100 years ago in which the Australian light horse played an incredible role in liberating that city from the Ottoman Turks. In the saddle they moved as stockmen do, agile, swift and skilled. In battle they stood as soldiers must, with horses safe from fire. But the Asheba in 17, they wrote a chapter new. They charged the open desert plains and leapt Turk, trench and gun. And fought on horseback, wild and strong, 
to take the prize that day. They are the Australian Light Horse. They are our story true. The landmark Australian Light Horse collection captures the memory of a legend. The skilled horsemen and their famous charge at Beersheba. Their love for their Australian bred stock horses and their courage on foot in battle. And uh, Israel owes a lot of gratitude to the incredible bravery and the courage shown by the Australian light horse over 100 years ago. Uh, uh, you know, this is a special period of time, isn't it, uh, Greg, um, that we are remembering the 100th anniversary of the Balfour Declaration, which is celebrated that uh, a few weeks ago. Plus, also, we are remembering the uh, First World War, and uh, we know that um, it was out of that war that God started to bring about his purposes for Israel and the Jewish people, and to consider that the Ottoman Empire had been in control and occupation of the Holy Land since 1517, uh, and then it was liberated in 1917 by General Allenby, exactly um, 400 years. Uh, do you think the timing of God uh, in terms of uh, using the Aus Australia as a nation to help bring about the liberation of the Holy Land w was significant for your nation? Uh, absolutely. Um, the, 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 the scripture says, he who blesses Israel, I will bless, or Abraham. I, I think that uh, our involvement there has done us proud. In fact, we're a nation that, uh, as a government even, is very pro-Israel. Um, I mean, just recently with the UN um, uh, Resolution 2334, our nation, uh, some people that I know in the government say there was a, a sense of, of disgust about how that was handled. Yes, we're, we're a a nation that is proud to support those that we consider friends and, and mates. And we do consider the nation of Israel a friend. Therefore, our historic involvement in the re-establishment of the Jewish homeland uh, in 1948, and you know, look at that nation now, and it's, it's something to look at. It's got its, its, its flaws, but it's a wonderful democracy in the middle of uh, a lot of non-democratic -democrat nations. It's something that we can be proud of. We're part of that. Um, we, we, we turned a key that ended 400 years of Ottoman Turkish rule and set up a stage for which the Jewish nation could be re-established. Uh, that's, that's what's called modern day Zionism. It's the re-establishment and protection and the development of the Jewish people in that land, which was their historical land. So yeah, from a godly perspective, from God's perspective, he's asked us to do a job. Uh, whether we knew we were doing the job or not, I don't know, but we had the great privilege in hindsight of being involved in that. I think that's what I take away, is whether the guys knew they were doing it at the time, God in his mercy, his grace and opportunity allowed us to be involved in that. Incredible. And uh, can you Tell us about the closeness of relationship between the nation of Australia and the nation of Israel in particular, because you know you, you, you were saying that uh, Australians see Israel as their friend, or as you'd like to call it, their mate. Um, so therefore, there is a natural tendency to defend and protect the nation of Israel from your nation. It is was it the Battle of, of Beersheba that developed that close ties between Israel? And Australia that we see today? I think it was certainly one of the big significant events that did that. Um, Australia has always um, voted along with Israel uh, in the United Nations uh, and it, you know has a history of, of, of support in that area but at a local level um, I just think that uh, you know we've got a, a lot of Australians come across to Israel particularly Christians that come to look at the Holy Land and uh, we have a huge number of Israeli backpackers come and visit Australia and they can be confident that when they come to Australia that they'll find us welcoming. And when we were running our church, we had 12 families in our church that would welcome um, ex-IDF or, or Israeli backpackers into their homes and just allow them to stay for free while they were just doing a travel around. I, I think, Simon, it was highlighted to me at the when we were at the reenactment um, a couple of weeks ago that uh, my wife was suffering a little bit of tummy trouble 
and we had to divert, we were heading towards the grounds to watch the reenactment, we had to go to a service station and she had to go to the toilet, you know, but in there there was no toilet paper and I, she, she said there's no paper in here and I said I'll, I'll organise it. So I went out and the, the attendant of the service station was serving a queue of people some coffees uh, and I said look we need some paper in the loo and the guy said look not a problem let me just serve the customers first uh, and then I'll get to your, um, your, your the toilet paper and the boss of the service station overheard him and he came rushing over and he said you stop exactly what you're doing right now he said this is an Australian they fought for us in Beersheba and instantly that guy was reprimanded and had to go and get the toilet paper so I think you know at least in Beersheba um, you know, and, and, and across, across Israel, because we talked to many about it, there is a sense from Israel of that joint mateship. It's not just Australia and towards Israel, but Israel has a great strong regard for its mateship with Australia as well. Absolutely. And, and do you think the characteristics of Israelis and also Australians play a big part in that? Because if you consider the, uh, the Israeli kibbutznik or the pioneer in Israel, they were farmers and then they became soldiers because they had to defend their land. Uh, and therefore they had to take up weapons against uh, Arab raiders. Um, so do you think that uh, because uh, Israelis had to cultivate the land, they had to build the land, and they're kind of pioneers, um, that this fits in very well with what Australia is and the makeup of Australians in general? Well, look, I, I think you're right. I just think that there's a realism with Israelis and there's a realism with Australians. We're not a real class society. I don't think Israel is a class society. But say we'd like, we don't have the different classes. We're just Australians and they're just Israeli or Jewish people. And so, yes, we've done it hard to, uh, to build up our nation. They've done it very hard, under probably much more focused and significant opposition to build their nation. Um, but yes, that pioneering spirit, definitely there's a, there's a, and in fact, if you get a bunch of Australians and Israelis together, it's like they're pretty much the same. Excellent, excellent. And, and, and Greg, uh, you were out there for the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Besheva. Like I said before, 10,000 Australians went to pay homage to the Australian Light Horse and the Anzac forces that actually fought against the Ottoman Turks um, to liberate the Holy Land over 100 years ago. Um, what was the impression of the majority of Australians there who were remembering a significant part of Australian history, but also being in the land that, uh, that Australia, together with the British forces, helped to liberate. Very proud. Um, there were many Christians there who obviously see the significance of its uh, link with uh, the re-establishment of the, the nation of, of, of Israel. But um, look, when those, uh, the hundred uh, men and women who are part of the Light Horse uh, did the reenactment and they, they actually walked to their horses down there because it had been uh, the, the ground had been recently turned over so they didn't do a charge as a reenactment although they, they went back and did a bit of a trot and a canter afterwards. But as those were coming down there's just a great sense of you know the bugle was playing the, the um, we'd been primed with a, one of the Perth and uh, uh, youth orchestras uh, who were playing a lot of the old you know it's a long way to Tipperary which Australians know you know or <laughs> Uh, a lot of those songs, there was a sense of great national pride. And, and you know, mates, while well, I was sitting next to, to, to Israelis on one side and Australians on the other, and we all had our hats on, and the Israelis, people we were sitting next to were hollering out, you know, you know for the Aussies coming down, the, down the, uh, the, 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 the dusty plain back down towards where we were seated. Fantastic. Our prime ministers were over there sitting together and the Governor General of New Zealand. Fantastic. Uh, atmosphere. Fantastic atmosphere. Excellent. So let's have a look now and uh, look what happened in the city of Beersheba on October the 31st this year as uh, Israel and the Australians remembered the liberation of their city, Beersheba. Please take your seats at the stages. We would like to begin the parade. 
And that looked like a, a very significant and uh, special day. Uh, what was it like to be there then, in the company of uh, your Prime Minister, in the company of the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, and also those who wanted to reenact the Battle of Beersheba and, and to really celebrate uh, and take pride in the Australian Armed Forces? Well, we were, personally, my wife and I were very, very proud to be there. Um, obviously, it's a long way to come to Israel to celebrate something like this. Um, but uh, we were so proud. In fact, our, I, th I thought the speeches that our Prime Minister... I think that was one of Malcolm Turnbull's best speeches that he gave. Uh, it was very Australian, and I think we all just related to that. That's how, that's how we relate. Uh, I thought that um, Prime Minister Netanyahu was gracious in his um, speech uh, towards the Australian and New Zealanders in our involvement and the acknowledgement of that involvement. It, it gives us great pride to know that the, New the Prime Minister of uh, Israel is uh, acknowledging that uh, and the Governor General of New Zealand as well was just a great speech so just to be in the midst of that we that footage that you've just seen there we were right in the middle of that we weren't as close to the Prime Ministers as that we were further down but um, you know banners waving cheering the horses getting a little skittish with all the the banners and and I, I just sensed the, even those we, these were people of the light horse reenacting this uh, it was as if we were watching the, the troops who had fought in the battle. And I think they felt that um, too as we were cheering them down the street. Um, yeah, a, a, a great occasion for Australia. I think, it, um, I think the Jewish people that we were involved with at that time felt exactly the same way. And what impact did this have upon um, the uh, public opinion back in Australia and also the media? Because you only have to Google the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Beersheba and there were so many articles covered by Australian news outlets. Um, what impact do you think that this had uh, back home in Australia on, on well, Australian public opinion? Look, uh, yeah, national pride for some. It's a, wow, what was that all about? Um, they weren't so aware of the Battle of Beersheba, although it's had some great coverage leading up into the event. Um, they're not, as I said before, normally thinking about Gallipoli. Uh, but uh, it's, it's also brought some adverse reaction as well. Um, there was a notable cartoon in the Canberra newspaper that was, um, that was uh, the, the Israeli embassy or the um, ambassador, um, you know, complained about that particular um, uh, cartoon. So it's brought, it's brought you know, I suppose it brought the discussion to the table again is why are we doing this? What's this all about? And it gives us an opportunity to explain um, the significance of the role of Australia in the re-establishment of the nation of Israel. Um, and, and look, if, it, if anything, if it promotes education, promotes people to go back and look at a film that was made by an Australian uh, of this particular campaign, uh, just to re-educate, especially our young people. It would be great if our young people could come, and I'd suggest they come to Israel, visit Israel, go to Beersheba, look, the ground is there. You can walk the place where the horses ran. I think it would be great for Aussies, young people, to do that. Absolutely, which I think is a very important one in terms of education, which is very important as well. Um, what do you think can come out of this um, celebrations and this remembrance of the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Beersheba in terms of the strategic relationship between Israel and Australia? 
Well, look, I, I have been saying for a, a long time, I think that Australia has a gutsy role in this battle, 1917, charged the wells of Beersheba, cracked through where it wasn't being cracked through. God used that nation in a very um, pioneering, forthright way. That suits our spirit, our psyche, our pioneering uh, spirit. I think it's time for Australia to rise up again. I think God is giving us an opportunity uh, to be involved in the furtherance of this great nation of Israel uh, as a mate. I mean, we're, we're talking about a nation that the majority, well, all, as far as I know, all embassies of nations are not in the capital of the nation, which is Jerusalem. They're currently sitting in Tel Aviv, which is not the capital of Israel. And I think Australia, you know, we're all waiting to see what, um, you know, the United States does. Will they move their embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem? Well, my challenge to Australia is let's do the charge again. A hundred years down the track, let's lead the way and tell our Israeli brothers and sisters that we don't think it's right for their capital, which they acknowledge as their capital, does not have the Australian embassy sitting in the middle of it. And so I would urge our government to be like Harry Chevelle and order the charge and General Grant order him into the wells of Beersheba. No one else is doing it. There's casualties falling all around. These brave, you know, pioneering, rugged Australians charging at the wells. Let's be the rugged Aussies that we're known to be that don't always obey the, the rules, I suppose. And let's do something no one else is prepared to do or hasn't got the guts to do. Let's move our embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem and say, hey, let's lead the way. Let's crack it open again. Let's do something that we can be proud of in another hundred years. Absolutely. And what do you think the spiritual um, benefits of that would be? Because we know in scripture that those who bless Israel will be blessed and those who curse Israel will be cursed. And an Australian, uh, the Australian government, by actually moving their, your embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, would be aligning themselves with God's foreign policy. Absolutely. We're a nation that is fundamentally blessed. And I believe we're fundamentally blessed because we have kept Judeo-Christian values. Uh, it's written into our laws, but because we have blessed Israel. I mean, people can write about this from a political science point of view until, until the end of days. But the fact is, the God of the Bible said, if you bless Israel, I will bless you. It's a simple remedy. I think as long as Australia continues to bless Israel, we'll be blessed. And this is gonna be something that would attract the very uh, blessing of God. It says in the scripture, Lord, let your face be turned to me, incline your face to me. It's talking about allowing the full presence of God, your, his attention to come upon you. Um, as a nation, we can invoke God turning his face to us again and, and continue to do so and bless us as a nation. Uh, we're primed, we're right at that point, Simon, where we could make a decision like this and, you know, it might surprise people, it might bring a lot of angst from other nations, but we're just the sort of people that can do it. Fantastic, because then you'd lead the way and, and other nations, maybe like the United States, would actually follow in kind if the Australian government had the courage and the bravery to move their embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. But I think it's also important the significance because it, it really would counter that um, hideous UN resolution that was uh, passed uh, last December, known as UN Resolution 2334, that denied any Jewish connection between the Jewish people and their capital, Jerusalem. And having visited Jerusalem recently and having attended the incredible light show at David's Tower organised by the uh, Israeli Foreign Ministry, 3,000 years of Jewish history um, shown on the walls of Jerusalem was absolutely breathtaking. And then you look at some of the archaeological discoveries there. There is no way that you can actually take away a Jew the Jewish identification with Jerusalem. Um, and this is where we are, where we find the nations believing lies rather than believing the truth. Uh, and so therefore I think by the Australian government moving the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem would not only have a, a huge political impact, it would also have a huge spiritual impact um, and give the Jewish people and the nation of Israel incredible hope. Uh, and it will remind them of who they are. And it will also remind them that uh, it's the Christians who are standing with them and love them in fulfilment of God's word in his scripture. Uh, no objection from anything you've said from me. Uh, I think the key word is it's insidious. It's ridiculous. 
It's re that United Nations resolution was just plain ridiculous, and that's why America and the UK and Australia just rejected it uh, right out up front. They called us the triumvirate, you know, <laughs> with a tiny little nation over there. We were saying, no, this is just not good enough. That's ridiculous. It, it goes against history. It goes against uh, the biblical, history, historical, legal rights. Just uh, refused everything that's uh, su supposed to be um, uh, awarded to Israel. Yeah. Let's uh, go and listen now to uh, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu uh, giving a speech to New Zealand forces and also Australian forces known as the Anzacs. Address. Governor General Patsy Radic, before I say welcome to Israel, to you uh, and to Sir David, I want to tell you that in my opinion, this is the first time that Maori was officially spoken on Tel Sheva. It is beautiful. It will be long remembered. I want to acknowledge equally Prime Minister of Australia, Malcolm Turnbull, and his wife, Lucy and all the distinguished guests that have come here from New Zealand, from Australia, and of course from Israel, and from other lands. We're remembering an act of courage that changed history. The indomitable spirit of the soldiers of New Zealand here, and the Australian light horse right there, changed history. It is... Uh, something that didn't take very long, in a few hours. But the pivot, the hinge of fate moved at that point. It required resources of courage and determination and resolution precisely because they were facing very fierce, strong, and determined troops. This makes their achievement all the greater. We are here standing in the city of Abraham. 4,000 years ago, our forefathers came here. Now, because of that day, 100 years ago, you see the modern city of Beersheba, with the cyber headquarters, with the future in our hands. We have peace, prosperity, and security but it was made possible because of those heroes. We always remember that. We remember our, the sacrifices of these young men from New Zealand and from Australia. We are sister democracies. We, um, New Zealand and Israel, have the advantage of being small relative to Australia, so I would have said our three small democracies, but that would be a gross misstatement but I would say are three valiant democracies uh, who have uh, created prosperity and hope for their peoples and by cooperating with each other for many other peoples. This forged uh, a bond of friendship that began in Gallipoli between New Zealanders, Australians, and the young uh, Jewish fighters who were the first Jewish fighting force in history. I spoke about that earlier in the cemetery. But I want to mention something else that happened that saved many, many lives. Because each life, each drop of New Zealand blood that was shed here and Australian blood that was shed there is precious blood. But it could have been a far greater tragedy for those families and for many more families. Were it not for Aaron Aronson, a brilliant scientist, an agronomist, and his sister Sarah, and their comrades, who established an intelligence ring that gave General Allenby the information and that said, you must come here. Don't go there. Don't go again to Gaza. Come to Beersheba. The British assessment was that because of the contribution of Aronson, tens of thousands of lives were saved. 
and Sarah Aronson, who took her life under severe torture rather than spill out these secrets. We remember too. Sarah's a name I like, I have to tell you. So Sarah, the wife of uh, Abraham, was here 4,000 years ago. Sarah Aronson was here, even though she wasn't 100 years ago. And we, the great democratic allies of New Zealand, Israel, and Australia, are here today as we celebrate the future. We remember the past, and we celebrate the future. But even so, even with that contribution of intelligence, you still needed courage to face entrenched troops here and entrenched troops there. Courage was required. And courage, of all the human values, is the most important one because it guarantees all the rest. There was plenty of courage that day. And of those fallen New Zealand soldiers and the fallen Australian light horse, we can say in the words of a man of extraordinary courage, King David, they were swifter than eagles, they were stronger than lions. We shall always be indebted to them, and we will always remember them. Thank you. And that was the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, remembering the incredible role played by the Anzac forces in helping to liberate the Holy Land from the Ottoman Turks 100 years ago during the First World War. Uh, very moving, very powerful speech. Uh, what did you make of what uh, the Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, had to say about Australia and New Zealand? Well, number one, he's just a great speaker um, and he's endearing and humble. Uh, I mean... <laughs> We're, we're uh, you know, our role was a Krieger one, but he's identified that and he's certainly uh, spoken to the hearts of every Australian and New Zealander, I'm sure, by um, that, that honouring speech. Um, I, uh, I hasten to say that, um, that uh, Israel has obviously become who it, who it is now under the hand of God and, and um, you know, our role there, important as it is, is um, is something that I think today uh, Israelis just so that none of this is in vain. Remember, you know the the, the God of Israel. Remember the the covenant with Abraham, um, and and also something to really take away from this is that you do have uh, mates in the world. Um, I was sitting under a goat hair tent. Uh, just outside the city of David, <clears throat> talking to a young man there who, who uh, has set up this tent in the Kidron Valley. And uh, he said, where are you from? Australia, I said. And uh, he said, oh, the Battle of Beersheba. And so I started to tell him about it and, and how our friendship was with Israel. And he said, it warms my heart to hear this. I didn't know that. Uh, and anyone watching on this, uh, on this program, uh, especially from Israel, it needs to know that there are people in the world that really do care and love the Israeli people, the Jewish people. And, um, you know, Australia is one of those. Christians are another group that, uh, you know, whilst not all Christians might have the same sense, a large, large number of Christians feel very strongly and very uh, warm-heartedly about the nation of Israel and their people. Absolutely. Uh, and in the dying mo uh, minutes of, of the programme, I have to ask you, Greg, what do you think the lessons are of the Battle of Beersheba and what is the legacy and also the spiritual legacy of that battle for Australia? Uh, look, I, I, I think the, the lessons from uh, this for Australia is just to, to if, if we can be mature enough uh, to be aware of the strategic importance that God has placed upon this nation for this world. The Bible says that it will be a light to the world. We as Australia can nurture, as our Prime Minister has already mentioned, some business developments that have happened uh, since then, but I think we just need to understand and recognise uh, that blessing.
Excellent. Uh, Pastor Greg uh, Cummings, I want to thank you so much for being my guest on the Middle East Report all the way from Australia. And uh, you've done your nation proud and we're very proud of Australia. So thank you for what uh, you brought to this programme today and you brought an incredible contribution. And um, I think our viewers need to keep Australia in our prayers. Uh, you might be thousands of miles away, but it's great to see that God has used your nation to stand with Israel and to stand with the Jewish people today. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. And uh, I just want to thank you for watching today's uh, Middle East Report. We've learnt about the incredible role that the Australian uh, Light Horse played in the crucial battle of Beshevan. So this song is dedicated to those brave men who served in the Australian Light Horse and also the New Zealanders and other British uh, soldiers played their part in liberating the Holy Land from the Ottoman Turks. The greatest cavalry charge in history I reckon. It's from the Sinai Desert, boys, on the way to Gaza. Jerusalem is in our sights, but first we need Beersheba, the waters of Beersheba. The soldiers ate their breakfast, bully beef and biscuits. They'd ridden for the last two days and nights Their faithful horses ground their oats Through bitted mouths and nose bags Veterans of a hundred desert fights Australian guns were blazing On the slopes of Tel El Saba The British fought the action to the west But the Turks and Germans grimly manned The ramparts of Beersheba Determined to withstand another test Come on, come on, infantry, hit them hard, artillery, if this operation's to succeed. Beersheba must be captured, we must take the town by nightfall, Beersheba's water is our greatest need. The day dragged on, the fight was grim, sunset just an hour away, Chevelle could see the only way to go. We'll charge their bloody trenches with the 4th and 12th light horse, it's the only way to win this little show. Mount up, 4th and 12th light horse, fix bayonets for the charge. Say your prayers and wave your mates goodbye. For you must ride those three long miles and take the turkey stretches. Beersheba boys, you must do or die. It's through the Sinai Desert boys on the way to Gaza. Jerusalem is in our sights, but first we need Beersheba. Plain, they rode a trot to form the line a canter for another mile or more Eight hundred wild colonial boys Then thundered to a gallop Riding as they'd never done before Shells are bursting round them Sheets of flame and dust Horses and their riders blown apart Still they charge relentlessly A mile ahead and they can see Trenches where the fight will really start. Machine guns fired, rifles spat their message at the horses that began to jump the trenches one by one. Then the fighting's hand to hand, the enemy could not withstand cold steel, and then the fighting's done. The canvas troughs are then unrolled, the horses slake their thirst, girths are slackened by Beersheba's gate. The tired Australian horseman strokes the neck of his old whaler. Well done, well bloody done, my dear old mate. It's through the Sinai Desert, boys, on the way to Gaza. Jerusalem is in our sights, for now we've won Beersheba, the waters of Beersheba. It's through the Sinai Desert, boys, on the way to Gaza. Jerusalem.